But let me introduce you to the panel. First, we've got uh, Gene Gant. Gene is actually my father, and uh, if you guys didn't know that. I don't know what Colleen meant by, if you don't know me, because I get around. I don't know what she was trying to say, but uh, uh, anyway, so Gene Gant, my father. <laughs> He's the CEO of Aventa. He's, um, actually, this is really interesting because we've got two panelists who have been in the business for 50 years this year, uh, which is really impressive, right? You have to guess which one. It could be this guy, it's not her. <laughs> and then we've got Ray Gregg, who is part of Encore Healthcare, respiratory therapist and a sleep tech. Uh, Megan Carpenter, who is a respiratory therapist um, and is the VP of ventilation for React Health, a wealth of knowledge. And then we've got Mr. Dean Hess, the managing editor of, of respiratory care. Can you give me a water, Satan? Thank you, sir. Um, so, we're going to go through some questions, and we've got, they're just going to take turns answering the questions. There's uh, um, anybody that wants to answer can, so there's no assigned questions. We're just going to have some fun with this, okay? So, respiratory care is obviously one of our uh, passions in this room, and it's, if, if you know me or know anything about me, it's one of my passions for sure. Um, and I, I get that from my father. Uh, I grew up kind of watching, I tell the story all the time that when I was growing up, because of the, oh, you guys can't see the questions. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll ask you. As I was growing up, because the, the therapists that I knew were my father and my uncle, and so in my mind, it was like nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, or n nurses, doctors, astronauts, and then respiratory therapists. And because uh, they were my heroes, they really were my heroes growing up. And so I didn't want to be like Superman or Batman, I wanted to be like my father and uncle. And uh, I always wanted to be, since I was four, I said I was going to be a respiratory therapist, an entrepreneur, and a millionaire by the time I was 30, and I got two out of three. Um, and so, but, but my goal in life was to be a respiratory therapist as, and to go into business and to be able to help people. And so this has always been my lifelong passion, uh, which I have inherited from my family. Um, so as we talk about these things, we're just going to kind of go through where have we been, where are we at, um, and where are we going as, as a profession. And so the first question is really about over the last couple years, I don't know if you guys knew it, but we had a pandemic and, um, in case you missed that. And so over the last couple of years, Respiratory therapists got a lot of attention early on, um, and so the question really is, what's happened since then? What have we done with that since then? We got a lot of respect early on. You, you saw respiratory therapists in the news a lot of times for the first time, and so the question is, how has that affected the profession? <laughs> well, first of all, we didn't get these questions ahead of time, or at least I didn't. Everybody um, else did. <laughs> Everybody else. Oh, that trick again. Uh, so, yes, we did get a lot of attention during the pandemic, and, and I think a lot of that has still lingered on. It, even though we're not in the public eye as much right now, people still know who we are more than they did before. Because um, I remember before the pandemic, you could say, I'm a respiratory therapist, and they'd say, oh, is that, what is that? Uh, now, if you say that, they say, oh, yeah, I've heard about you guys. You know, y'all were on the front lines at the pandemic. Um, so I, I think it's been a, a, unfortunately, it was a, a benefit for the profession. Uh, it gave us a platform. It elevated us quite a bit. Uh, and I think that has, has lasted on. Um, I think we still have a lot of work to do and, and shouldn't stop. Uh, but I think that platform will help us in the future go forward. <laughs> I, I fear a bit that maybe as a profession, we did not take full advantage of the exposure that we got two to three years ago. Uh, I agree with Gene that some of that has been sustained, but I, I wish that we were doing a better job of not just sustaining that recognition, but building that recognition. And I'm not sure the right way to do that, so I, I'm not a good one at knowing how to market the profession and so forth. It just seems as though there is an opportunity that was presented to us that we did not take full advantage of. And I think that there are still 
opportunities that we might look for to, for example, make respiratory therapy something that high school students know about and think about and want to select as their career because that's really the future of respiratory care. Uh, I can speak for New England. I'm sure it's similar in Eastern Tennessee. There's really a shortage of respiratory therapists and we need to be getting people into schools and so forth. So I think there, there is, there's a lot more that we could do. And you know, I wish I knew how to address that and address it quickly. To that point, there is a massive shortage of respiratory therapists, which is the next question. Um, and so what does the future look like for respiratory therapists because we've had such a shortage? And can we talk a little bit about what that shortage has done for the profession and what it's going to look like in the coming years from what the projections are? So I would say one of the things that has occurred uh, with the shortage is maybe uh, further elevating some of the telehealth options and allowing folks to be able to remotely interact with, uh, with patients. Maybe not so much effectively in the, in the hospitals, but in the DME space, right? Maybe uh, the DMEs have been able to curb how frequently they're visiting patients and supplementing that with programs that involve a very high tech and hands-on virtual interactions with patients. And I think that has certainly scaled uh, the profession and allowed for more patients to have interaction than, than before, which has helped to offset some things. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, uh, uh, to Megan's point, telerespiratory, telehealth, uh, particularly for, you know, in the home care environment, maybe even, even some aspects within, within acute care or, or clinic care. I think that's clearly just going to continue to be a, a big growth area, an area of opportunity for us as therapists. And that's not to say that, you know, kind of that traditional role of therapist is going to go away. But like everything, you know, with technology, with innovation, we have to be, you know, flexible and open to it and, and able to evolve with it. Uh, so, you know, I think that there's certainly a role moving forward and, and we're seeing that, you know, uh, companies, you know, Encore, Candily, we have a telerespiratory uh, program, actually a few different programs. There's other companies, other vendors that have telerespiratory programs, you know, certain HMEs depending on their size, you know, particularly, you know, I know at least of a couple of nationals that have some version of some sort of remote telerespiratory type call center or outreach program that is dedicated on kind of clinical outcomes. So not just like say a resupply or something. So there, I think there's gonna to continue to be opportunities uh, in that arena for, for therapists. So let me speak to the acute care setting. And the point, the thing that I want to, the point that I want to make here is that in acute care setting, we need to stop spending time doing things that don't matter. So their <coughs> evidence does not support that incentive spirometry makes a difference in patient outcomes. <laughs> so we just need to stop doing it. We need to redirect those therapists who are doing incentive spirometries to doing things where the evidence shows that it makes a difference. The evidence does not support giving every intubated patient an albuterol treatment every four hours. And in fact, the evidence shows that for patients with ARDS, they have poorer outcomes if you do that. So we as respiratory therapists need to learn what is, makes a difference, what doesn't make a difference, and get rid of those things that don't make a difference and focus on the things that do. So I know that there are concerns that, you know, when I lecture on these things sometimes, there are concerns with, well, if we stop doing all that unnecessary stuff, what are those therapists going to do? We're going to have to lay off people. And I always say, I bet there's a lot of things you should be doing that you're not doing because you're too focused on doing the things that don't matter. So rather than have respiratory therapists doing incentive spirometry treatments that don't make a difference, if you don't have a pulmonary rehab program, you should have a pulmonary rehab program. Take those therapists and start a pulmonary rehab program, which has shown to improve outcomes of patients with COPD. 
So I think the way that we, a big way that we address the RT shortage is we just stop doing the things that haven't been shown to make a difference. So you're saying we're not bringing I'll back. Get off my dad, or I'll get off my soapbox. So we're not bringing back IPPB? <laughs> Actually. <laughs> Joking. I, I just want to add an amen to all that. But, uh, yeah. You're exactly right. We, we need to be practicing at the top of our license, not all this fluff down here at the bottom. Uh, and I agree that if we stopped doing all those unnecessary things, we wouldn't have the shortage we have right now. If we continue on the way we're doing right now, we are at risk because there are not enough people. And if we put people into every school across the country, it's still going to be a couple of years before all the shortage loosens up. So either we go backwards and allow people that are not trained to do some of the things that we've been doing, or we stop doing the things that are not necessary, which makes the best sense, I think. So what can we do as respiratory therapists? So we see that the AARC is doing some things, MBRC is doing some things. You know, there's things that are happening to try to recruit more respiratory therapists. But what can we do in our hometowns to be able to help recruit respiratory therapists to go into programs? Because the enrollment rates of programs have been down. Uh, graduation rates have been down. You know, the, the amount of therapists coming out of programs is less now than it was three years ago. And so what can we do as RTs in our hometowns to help promote respiratory therapist and get people uh, going into programs. I think Dr. Hess has already mentioned that. We need to be going into the high schools. We need to be talking to the younger people, uh, telling them about the avenue of respiratory therapy. Um, a lot of people are not exposed to it, and they, they should be. Uh, we've started doing that in our hometown, and I think everybody here has that opportunity to, to reach out and, and affect someone uh, there's nothing better to me than to have somebody come to me and say, I got into respiratory therapy because of something you said or something you did years ago. I mean, that's, a, that's an ultimate compliment to me. Uh, so I think that, that on the ground level is something that everybody could participate in. Um, and, of course, improving our image or continuing to improve our image, as Dr. Hess said as well. Um, we need to take that platform that I mentioned a while ago and then jump off of that platform into something bigger. Yeah, no, I, I would echo that. I mean, I agree. I mean, I think this idea of engagement earlier on with individuals as they're maybe trying to decide a career path, you know, I think high school, you know, is a great opportunity. I know I've got uh, twin daughters that are juniors in high school. They go, happen to go to a STEAM high school. Uh, there, there's a whole alternative program and path for kids that don't think, you know, maybe long-term college, you know, but they're looking for, you know, uh, there's like, a, you know, kind of a beginning nursing program for those students at a high school level. Uh, there's like high-end manufacturing programs for some of those kids that are interested in that. So this idea, if we can do it with nursing, you know, and things like that, I mean, I think there'd be an opportunity for, for you know, kind of earlier introduction of the field to individuals for sure. I think it would also be really important for us right now to point out to the youth who are, are uh, looking at what other opportunities are out there for them and understand what's important to them. I think we've seen you know, work ethics change over the years. We've seen how much time folks want to spend doing life versus doing work over the years. And in our youth right now, they have a lot of hobbies and they want to enjoy those things. And, and maybe some of us in this room have moved to a 50 or 60 hour work week because that's how we were brought up. But we can look at these youth and recognize, hey, there's opportunities for you to still pursue your passions and this career. Uh, if you were to go down this path, right? How appealing does a three-day work week sound to you or a four-day work week uh, to allow them to continue to explore things and, and be independent as they go down the professional route? So I think that's something that we should really highlight for them as we're having those engagements and outreach. Yeah, we gotta have your Snapchat time. Yeah. <laughs> you can still be an influencer. <laughs> I, I, I think we all have an individual responsibility to show the most positive light of what we do as respiratory therapists. So as we are out in the community interacting with all of the people that we interact with, show that we're enthusiastic about what we do. I'm a respiratory therapist. I am really proud to be a respiratory therapist and I would encourage anyone 
to pursue what has been a very fulfilling career for me. But how often do we say, oh, man, I don't know about respiratory, you know. I go in there, and they, I just do, I mean, I do 100 nebs a day. Nobody gives me any respect. Well, is anyone going to want to be a respiratory therapist if that's how we present ourselves in our profession? So I think we all have an individual, an individual responsibility to be upbeat, to be enthusiastic, to be proud of what we are. So that if we're at a school board meeting and we're proudly talking about this great day we had working in the ICU, somebody's going to say, well, you know, my daughter's thinking about a health career. How, do, how, would, they, how would they find more out about that? So I, th I think, you know, we, we all have a responsibility just as how we interact with people around us. Very good. Yeah, I think the, the, the challenge that we had with the pandemic was so many people got burned out. And when, when the whole industry is burned out, then we don't talk about the good things. And so it creates that situation where you have less enrollment. I don't, I don't think a lot of people, if you look on the social media pages, respiratory therapy break room, there's not a lot of positive comments. And so somebody says, you know, my kid wants to go into respiratory and there's a million negative comments and a few positive ones. So we have to do better about being a positive force, going into the high schools. I think that's such a powerful thing. Um, I go into the, the local high schools, take pig lungs. If nothing else, even if they never become respiratory therapists, hopefully I can stop a few of them from vaping by showing them the pig lungs, right? And really pressing on that point. So I think there's so much that we can do in our communities um, and we can do individually as respiratory therapists to, to promote the profession. So thank you guys. So how has the last few years since the pandemic really changed what a respiratory therapist does in a hospital? I know you touched on this, Dr. Hess. Uh, you want to add anything else to that? I, I, I guess it depends, you know, your hospital. So I think about the, you know, the hospitals around the area where I work now, they, you know, this is an urban setting with big teaching hospitals and so forth, uh, it's probably not changed a whole lot for us because before the pandemic, a lot of our practice was directed towards acute care and critical care. So during the pandemic, we just did a lot more of that. So instead of having 100 ventilators a day, we had 250 ventilators a day. And then we went back to, again, just having 100 ventilators today. So I guess I would be interested maybe in hearing how it has affected rural hospitals, you know, hospitals that are 200-bed hospitals rather than 1,000-bed hospitals that are not teaching hospitals and so forth. And I, I don't know. Anybody else? We I, guess I, I guess I'm the acute care guy on the yeah. panel. Okay, so one of the things that the pandemic really, um, really covered up was the fact that in 2019, the end of 2019, there were new rules passed in skilled nursing facilities where respiratory therapists were now recognized, not directly, but indirectly, uh, under ancillary services. And so there's reimbursement for respiratory therapy in nursing homes to be able to drive more reimbursement. Most people uh, didn't realize that because it really got eclipsed by at the beginning of 2020, the, the pandemic started. And so, but what we're starting to see is that that market, skilled nursing facility market, where there used to not really be a lot of respiratory therapists, Tennessee has been kind of an anomaly over the years because you had people like uh, my father who had programs in, in nursing homes and had a lot of nursing homes that had respiratory therapists. Most states, that's kind of unheard of, but we're seeing a trend happen there. So I'd love for you guys to talk about uh, what is that trend? What do you see in the nursing home space? And uh, how has is, how is the practice of respiratory care really changed in the nursing home and what's going to happen in that space? I feel a little targeted. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm, I'm really, very proud of what's happened in Tennessee. Um, we, some years ago, back in 2000, uh, actually started uh, one of the first ventilator units outside the walls of a hospital and outside the wall, El Taco was still a hospital, but in a nursing home space. And our 
whole idea was that we were doing home ventilation, so we would bring these folks in, we would do training there, and we would do a better job of training patients and families to take care of their loved ones at home if we had them in a, in a closed environment, a longer time, you know, teaching too. So we first started that first unit and we started bringing patients in and lo and behold, we staffed it 24 hours a day with respiratory therapists. And lo and behold, our therapists were calling us pretty quickly after these patients were admitted and saying, we've, we've weaned Mrs. Jones, she's not going home on a ventilator. So our business idea failed miserably but we stumbled onto something that was much bigger. So we expanded on that, and over the period of about a year, uh, we were very fortunate in that we had a, a, a governor elected that was uh, from the managed care world. He had sold his managed care company, made his millions, and ran for office. And we got audience with him and told him what we were doing, and he got it. And so he supported us, uh, introduced us to the Bureau of Ten Care, which is our Medicaid, um, and we began working with the Bureau of Ten Care and earned their respect. Uh, today, we now oversee that program in the various nursing homes that have ventilator units. Uh, we set standards of care. They have to meet those standards. They actually get paid on a, a performance model. So the more, uh, the more weans they have, the more decannulations, uh, the more uh, less infections and the less hospitalizations, that gives them a score. They also are given a score for uh, the, the technology they use. If they use coffee, if they use high flow, if they use modern ventilators, in fact, the ventilators have to be portable, uh, they also get a score there. We were able to get that embedded into the ten care rules, so now facilities are paid according to their outcomes and they're paid more for the technology they use. A huge accomplishment in a state. Beyond that, we then stepped out into the, to the home setting and started working with the COPD population and the vents at home and trachs at home. And today we have 40 therapists in our um, in our company, all of them have MPI numbers and all of them have Medicaid numbers. So we are actually getting paid for clinical services that we're doing, not for the equipment because we don't provide any equipment. But again, we think that's a good model and we're seeing other states now start to adopt it and we're talking with other states. Uh, we went live in Chicago just last week with a project up there to do the same thing with the pay for performance in the nursing home setting. So I think the future is very bright there. Uh, we see across the country, we still have LTAX, but we still see a lot of areas where there's some pushback from, from payers to use LTAX. They want to use a skilled nursing facility, so our job is to make those skilled nursing facilities better improve what they're doing. Um, beyond that, taking one more step, we started an accreditation program in partnership with the Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety. And so we're now giving out, giving accreditations and doing surveys on these facilities that want to be accredited. Uh, we have a couple in Tennessee already. We have two in Hawaii. Uh, we have three that are getting ready to happen in New York City five in Chicago, one in, in Indiana, and so on and so forth. So people are stepping up, improving the care, uh, and I think the future is bright there as well. Yes, I did. Exactly what he said. <laughs> and I think the interesting thing about respiratory therapists and skilled nursing environments is if you look at the states, where it's happened a lot. It's really where you had a respiratory therapist-led company who started programs. Chicago is a good example. Most facilities in the Chicago market have respiratory therapists in the nursing home, even without vent units. And it's because there's a company there that's been pushing it for years. And so really, the impact that we can have as respiratory therapists to be able to drive that level of care into skilled nursing facilities is there. Oftentimes we miss it because we're not out there pushing it. And so I, I challenge you guys in your communities to try to figure out, do the local uh, skilled nursing facilities have respiratory therapists? And if they don't, how can we get them there? Because um, usually in a, in a skilled nursing facility, a respiratory therapist is the highest skilled clinician there when it comes to acute care. 
Um, and it's really scary not to have a respiratory therapist in a skilled nursing facility. So it's something we should all be pushing for is how do we get respiratory therapists into those environments because it's the best thing for the patients and for our profession. Okay, so we touched a little bit on telehealth. Um, can we talk a little bit about what's happened with telehealth in acute care over the last couple of years, if anything, from a respiratory therapist perspective? I know early on we saw some things happen um, with telehealth, and we've seen some things that are happening from the U.S. into third world countries with telehealth. Uh, but what's happening in acute care now with telerespiratory, telehealth, if anything at all, and how has the, the public health uh, pandemic evolved that? I'm obviously not the acute care expert, but I will comment on this. So I do think that if we think about telehealth, and this is a little more of kind of a hybrid situation, I think. I think about from the acute care where we might be seeing respiratory involvement with telehealth from, from an acute care. I think about some of these transition to care models, these 30-day programs that, that where the RT might have a, a hospital-based RT navigator that's working with these patients to try and ensure that they're not bouncing back. I think with some of these programs, there is a telehealth aspect to that, that even after you know, being discharged, that navigator is having a certain amount of contact with that patient, you know, at least for that first 30 days plus to see how they're doing to kind of check on them. And in some cases, actually the uh, latest issue of Home Care Magazine, there's a great article about McLaren Health System in Michigan and their transition to care program, and they have an RT navigator. Her name's Kelly Long, and she actually goes into the patient's home for a 30-day plus period, but there's also an aspect of telehealth involved with that as well. So there was, there was interest in this from an acute care standpoint uh, during COVID, and there were a few hospitals who did set up some tele-respiratory care to complement what was going on in the ICUs. Uh, and some of them have reported that experience. Uh, University of Pennsylvania, for one, has written a couple of papers about their experience with this during COVID. Quite honestly, I don't know if their tele-respiratory program was shut down after COVID or if it still exists. I, I know people there and, and uh, just kind of reminder to ask them if that's still going on. Uh, this has been studied from a physician standpoint a lot, and a physicians I, I think where it is used primarily is in the rural system. So, for example, a rural hospital who cannot afford to hire intensivists for the ICU. So there may be intensivists who will oversee what's happening in the ICU from a telemedicine standpoint. So they will round on the patient, they'll go over all the labs and so forth. And some of you may have some experience with that. Uh, I think that what has been found in acute care is that it is helpful for physicians, the patients, and for respiratory therapists, somewhat, at least during COVID. But the issue becomes you still need somebody on site to do all of the psychomotor skills things. So, you know, you can be a therapist and say, you know, from 15 miles away looking in in the ICU and say, this patient doesn't look very good, we should get a blood gas, but there needs to be somebody there to draw the blood gas. Or, you know, we need to make some adjustments on the ventilator because the patient is, is completely out of sync with the ventilator. Well, at least now there are not good ways to do that remotely. It can be done remotely. I would argue it's better done at the bedside. Or this patient has secretions bubbling out of their endotracheal tube. So remotely, it's kind of tough to pass the end uh, suction catheter and clear the secretions. So I, I think, you know, what might be helpful, and even in the future, is having 
you know, tell a respiratory therapist to be another set of eyes to complement what is going on in the unit, but we're not going to be able to have, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we can have tell a respiratory therapist who would do the respiratory care in an ICU. Now, maybe we would need fewer of them. I don't know. That's yet to be learned. But, you know, who's going to suction the patient? Who's going to draw the blood gas? You know, those kinds of things. Add to what's been <laughs> talked about already, uh, we are working on a project now with uh, LSU to start taking uh, babies home that are ventilator dependent. They have, of course, as we have, there's a shortage of nurses as well. So they're not able to discharge those kids like they have been in the past with nurses in the home to do the suction or to do the monitoring. So we're working on a project with them now so that at least we will have monitoring in place. Uh, we're looking at entitled CO2 and pulse oximetry as well as video monitoring uh, so that they can discharge these patients home and so that the families then can at least go to the bathroom and have a little piece in the bathroom by themselves for a minute. Uh, so there, there's some extensions like that. And, and of course, in that scenario, this would be monitored. If there was an intervention needed, then that intervention would start at the, at the console where we're monitoring that. Um, we wouldn't be able to suction the patient, but we'd be able to tell somebody, you need to go suction that patient. Um, th this is an interesting project because it's not been done before. Uh, they also want to add an element of, of AI to it, which is, uh, you know, something that I, I think is up and coming, obviously, for all of us to be watching. Um, and so we're pretty excited about that. It's an extension of telehealth that involves respiratory therapists, but it won't replace the bedside, as you say, Dr. Hess. Well, to that point, let's talk about telerespiratory care in, in the post-acute setting, and what have we seen there in nursing homes, in the home, anywhere in post-acute, and how have those models, even pulmonary rehab, how have those models started to evolve? Well, I mean, specific to home, Zach kind of teed it up. I mean, we, we kind of touched on it earlier. I mean, there are more and more of these, you know, telerespiratory programs or telerespiratory companies you know, again, as Encore, we have some of those services, but there are other vendors that offer telerespiratory services. You know, one thing I think of is like remote PAP setups for uh, CPAP patients uh, that would prefer a remote setup. Um, so that ability now with technology, both with the, the, the telecommunication technology, but just the technology of the devices and the intuitiveness of the therapeutic devices uh, as well, we are seeing more remote setups and things in, in, like, for example, the sleep field. And I think we'll continue to see that. But there's also telerestory services where it might be not just a piece of equipment, instruction, and training, but it is more of a clinical check-in, some remote assessments, things like that. So I think we'll continue to see that grow over time. I think a big aspect of the telehealth would really be the telemonitoring side of it. So you know which patients are needing that interaction. And I think where we've seen a lot of the remote monitoring platforms, specifically in the home care space move, is allowing the HME companies to cater which patients they're interacting with the most, right? So recognizing which patients haven't turned their device on for two days, which patients have seen a decline in their compliance, uh, or you know perhaps which patients are not hitting the, the clinical outcomes and monitoring on their home ventilator. I think that that's allowed for better patient outcomes, quicker interaction with these patients, which hopefully could save a patient who may have otherwise gone non-compliant over time or, or fallen off their utilization of therapy, uh, as well as, back to some of our former questions, allowed the HME companies to scale a little more effectively and focus their time on the patients who need help the most versus otherwise checking a box and going to visit everybody on a less frequent basis uh, because they didn't have access to that telemonitoring uh, availability. We think about telehealth and telemonitoring and so forth as this new thing. And I, I, for, for many, many years, uh, probably for 25 years at Mass General, I was the RT in the ALS clinic. and. 15, 20 years ago, I was interacting with patients on Skype, and then iPhones come out, and we were using FaceTime, because we had 
clinic patients from all over New England and New York and Bermuda and, you know, for ALS patients, it's difficult to make clinic visits and so forth. So I would schedule uh, Skype calls and FaceTime calls and so forth. And I would often have the DME provider who would be there while we were having our interaction and we would make ventilator changes and change prescriptions and so forth. So some of this has been around for a long time, not as sophisticated as the stuff you're talking about, but you know, there's been a way to do this for many years. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing is that, as he said, it's been around for a while, but now it's really evolving. And I think it's gonna evolve a lot more. I mean, there are robots now that they put in skilled nursing facilities, hospitals, and you can just click a room that you want it to go to and it will go to that room and you can interact with the patient through the robot. Um, and so there's, there's, there's gonna be more and more evolution to do this. And, and a lot of that problem in the skilled nursing facility came from the fact that it was hard to have somebody on the other end to push a cart in there to do telemedicine with the patient. And so now there's ways to solve that. And so with artificial intelligence, with the technology evolutions, we're gonna see so many more opportunities that we need to get out in front of to make sure that we're a part of the discussion. You know, if you're not at the table during these discussions, then you're probably on the menu. And so we gotta be there uh, having the discussions, figuring out how do we as respiratory therapists get involved in these types of models. So the last few years, we've talked about the hospital, but what about home care? What's happened in home care since the public health emergency? The cost of goods have gone way up. The, the ability to go out and deliver um, equipment to patients has, has really changed. So can you talk about home care? How has the public health emergency changed home care? Yeah, so I think that uh, it's made all the home care companies very regularly uh, able to say to a doctor, I'm sorry, doctor, we don't have that, but um, I can give you something else, right? And so I think that it, to some extent, it's given the HME company a, a bit more autonomy to, whereas before the physician was really driving what product was being put on a patient and what was being requested, as a result of the public health emergency, the DME company maybe has a bit more autonomy to say, doctor, I know that's what you want, but they have a, a bit more say-so in what products are eventually ending up on patients, which started with issues of scarcity, scarcity from the public health emergency, but has changed over time. And I think that overall, it's improved the dialogue between the, the DME company and the physician and allowed for more interactions and not just that one-sided interaction that was maybe happening very regularly in the past. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I've seen that as well with with uh, HME companies in that, you know, in the past where the kind of the power of the script and maybe the brand preference that might be on that script really kind of, you know, drove, you know, what the home care company had to do. You know, nowadays it, it, it's just completely different. I mean, there is more control from the home care side to say, well, you know, we don't have that or we can't get that or, well, we can get that, but it will be this many weeks before we can provide that, but we have an alternative that could be provided, you know, tomorrow. So yes, I, I think there's that. I think that, you know, the other thing we've seen with coming out of the pandemic is not just kind of supply uh, chain issues, but, you know, labor shortages. And, you know, we've kind of had this kind of hangover effect coming out of COVID with just, and not just in healthcare, it's, you know, has anyone, you know, tried to go to a restaurant lately or tried to, you know, get checked into a hotel in a timely manner? It's just service in general has been kind of lagging and, and slow to come back. And so uh, I think that's a challenge for our home care providers is, is finding really good qualified uh, team members, particularly on the clinical side, who are engaged. Uh, and so that labor shortage is still there. And one, one thing that I've seen a lot um, is that the DMEs and the home care providers, they don't have the opportunity to speak to the physicians like they used to. Now to get into a doc's office to do a presentation or to show them a new product, it's almost impossible. Some are not doing it at all. Um, we've had the occasion on, on several times to recommend to a physician a, a high flow in the home and the physician's answer was, well, we only do that in the ICU. And their version of high flow is much different from our version of what's going out in the home, and they don't even know that home units exist, that it's available. 
And and that, I think, is a real problem. And it's not the DME's fault. They're trying. It's not our fault. It's not the manufacturer's fault. But somewhere there's been a wall built um, that keeps us from getting to the physicians like we need to. And, and for some reason, they don't seem to be getting the education that they need to be getting. Uh, I, I keep thinking, don't they show this at your conferences too? But maybe not. I don't know. Uh, so, so I think that's a problem, and, and there's been that tunnel vision of the docs ordering exactly what they ordered 15 years ago, and they're going to keep ordering it forever, even though that doesn't exist anymore, and, you know, we've moved on. Um, it, so I, I, I think that we've, you know, we've got a lot that we could do to continue education like that and to, and to make things better. Uh, the DMEs are also, from the manufacturer point of view, facing shortages of, of pieces and parts. Uh, we're, we're told that that's why a lot of products that we are used to having are no longer going to be available because they can't get that switch that used to cost $5, but it's now $500. Um, and that's a real problem as well, supply chain. So let's talk about, we got a few more minutes. Let's talk about uh, value-based care and outcomes in the home care space because one of the things that we've seen in, in the acute care space is that everything's based on quality and readmissions and all these quality measures. We've seen the same thing in physician offices and ambulatory care, but it really hasn't hit home care. Home care is still a 100% fee-for-service business, but we're living in this value-based or outcome-based world. And so how do you think that that is going to affect home cares over the next couple of years? I mean, I think, I think you summed it up. I mean, yes, it is going to shift. I mean, you know, the vast majority of the other areas in, in health care have already shifted over at least a large percentage to some sort of value-based or outcome-based uh, payment model or, you know, pay for perform performance type model. So it really is just a matter of time before it comes down uh, to home care. And we are starting to see that in some areas. You know, there was news in some of the home care magazines about, you know, Humana awarded a large contract to a couple different large national providers that was a value-based care model uh, or, or payment structure uh, for their service. So we'll, we'll just continue to see that. Uh, in a way, you know, there, there's, you know, we kind of have to with the way healthcare costs are going up. So that ability to, you know, pay for performance, pay for better outcomes, uh, you know, reduce the readmissions, that, that, that's just key. And, and we'll just continue to see, particularly with the growth in Medicare Advantage, the way Medicare Advantage plans are kind of, you know, taking over, over, say, traditional uh, Medicare. We'll continue to see more and more of these value-based models being put into place. <laughs> Thank you. You know, when I think about the particular topic, the first thing that comes to mind is the COPD patient population. And this is a patient population that, that hospitals were tasked with reducing readmissions. Uh, for many years, they've been receiving penalties, and they've already moved to this value-based plan. Uh, but without including the, the home care side of things, I don't think that it will ever be truly successful. You know, as you mentioned, costs have continued to rise. In, in that particular patient population, I think the, the data says that in 2010, it cost $39 billion to manage the COPD patient population in the U.S. healthcare economy. That number this year is estimated to be around 52 billion, right? And so, uh, you know, just doing it in the acute care space isn't enough. There has to be something bridging that gap from hospital to home. Uh, we have seen some of the payers moving that way. I think some of the telehealth and telemonitoring driving outcomes will make for. Uh, accountability for the DME companies to ensure that they're delivering these outcomes to continue to get these uh, these contracts and then the other side of it is going to be better bridging the gap between hospital and home right I think that we know that the hospital gold standard of managing that COPD patient population has become utilization of non-invasive ventilation and increasingly in the past couple of years integrating high flow therapy into that but there's still those doctors out there that have been doing the same thing for 15 years, right? They're not driving the same car they were driving for 15 years ago, but they still think that BiPAP is the best way to manage a COPD patient in the home. Uh, and, and the reality is that couldn't be further from the truth, right? We, we don't have the ability to see those patients on bilevel therapy in the home very frequently. Uh, it doesn't have the, the ability to make those auto adjustments to treat the patient's disease. So I think with 
seeing that value-based care move into the home, we will also hopefully see a bit more of a pivot of ensuring that the patients are on the right device at the right time in their disease progression and recognizing that gold standard of NIV and high flow therapy in the hospital and carrying that home with those patients to drive better outcomes than before. And obviously I think that the DME world, the home care world, and outside, anywhere outside the hospital has been an outcomes desert pretty much. We've not had real outcomes data uh, we could we could always and we always did go to the physicians and say oh we've you know only have you know 10 percent rebound well show me your proof of that well you just have to take our word for it because that's what we have you know now what we have with the software programs that are available is we are able to connect to the EMRs and so the data that we're now mining is real data and for the first time we're actually going to be able to have some proof of what we do is, is really working. Uh, and that's that's relatively a new thing, uh, especially in the outside the hospital. Um, Dr. Hess in the, in the hospital world has always had this controlled environment where you had, you had the data-driven protocols, you had the evidence there. Um, we've always just made the evidence up outside of the hospital because it sounded good. So whoever had the best sales team got the business. <laughs> So now it's getting the proofs in the pudding and we're really seeing some real data come out. So that's, I think that's very encouraging uh, for the patient population, for, for us as clinicians as well, so that we can stand on something that's solid rather than on shaky ground that we made up. One of the things that strikes me as I'm listening to others and I'm thinking about the talk that I gave earlier this morning is improved value might be more costly care. So let's think about that for a minute. So CMS is all about cutting costs, you know, and so forth. But if we begin starting every patient with stable chronic COPD, on non-invasive ventilation because we have the evidence that they will live longer, that will increase the cost of care. And maybe we need to think about how we are going to respond to our CMS friends when they say, it's gotten a whole lot more expensive to take care of these patients because you're doing the right thing. Thank you guys so much. Did you guys enjoy that panel? Yeah? Good. Give them a round of applause.